Yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry, um, yeah, yeah, that works, right? Yeah, yeah. great. Um, <coughs> so, um, I, I, we, we use classical machine learning models to, um, to model quantum properties of, of matter and particular chemistry is uh, um, an interesting field because um, it's dictated by the physics of the valence electrons which are quantum objects and so the equations you need to solve are quantum mechanical equations and we try to um, use machine learning to do that. Now before I get to that I, I should acknowledge the people doing the work. Uh, so these are recent pictures from my group. Um, we, we, we are part of the University of Basel. It's the oldest university in Switzerland, uh, 1400 something or so. Uh, it was founded and, and that's the Faculty of Science here. Um, we, we received a lot of funding for partially for that work and so we are really thrilled to see this interest. Uh, including uh, communities which are foreign to chemistry. And so I feel a little bit like a foreigner here. And uh, I, I think I'll, what I'll try to do is to portray uh, the kind of problems we have in chemistry and to maybe uh, or hopefully convince you that uh, this might be uh, of interest also to, to look <coughs> if, if some of your um, expertise could help with the pro problems we have. And, and the problems are, are quite substantial. Now, um, why generally, why would you even bother about chemistry? Um, I, I picked two examples. One is, is more philosophical. This is Friedrich Wöhler, a 19th century uh, chemist, uh, 19th century chemist um, from Germany. He, he um, demonstrated that the atoms in an inorganic solid like uh, this ammonia cyanate, um, aka the um, mother-in-law's, uh, the salt for the mother-in-law, um, that these atoms um, can be transformed into urea, an organic compound uh, which you would find in organisms. So, so this, this transition that, that atoms, I don't know, from Cleopatra um, also happen to be in your body um, or from some, some uh, inorganic matter. There's a, a fundamental sort of magical or alchemical um, twist and, and that's certainly fascinating. Now, um, more from a utilitarian point of view, you could argue that chemistry is, is just important for human mankind. And, um, and at the end of last century, Nature published this millennium essay which started out by asking what's the most important invention of the 20th century? And it wasn't aer aeroplanes, nuclear energy, or, or quantum mechanics. It, it was the synthesis of ammonia, which, which the author picked. And um, the reason is, if, if, if you look at the uh, production of ammonia, shown here in green, it's a function of time. Um, this was crucial for, to be produced at the industrial scale. Um, using the Harbour Bosch. I could give a chalk talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I'm not advancing fast enough. So, anyhow, so um, at the same time, uh, so ammonia is, is necessary for uh, producing fertilizers, and this allowed to avoid starvation for, for millions of people, and, and so the world population grew a lot and um, uh, if you like humans uh, that's a good thing um, the the I think it's interesting the world wars you you don't even see them on on this growth right so so chemistry is more important than politics you could argue um, so how how do we do on chemistry in, in terms of chemistry how, how is our understanding depends a little bit how you define understanding but if if you just look at how well do we do in predicting chemical behavior. Um, this is the phase diagram of, of water. So it shows you as a function of temperature and pressure in which aggregation state 
the matter occurs and, and these lines show you the, the transitions, the phase transition lines. And you see in, in blue, this is experiment, and in black is state-of-the-art theory. So that's state-of-the-art, and at, at best you're something of, you're off by 10, 10 degrees. So if, if you have 10 degrees too much in your body, you're dead, right? So, and, and this is water, so it's, you, it's a, a molecule with just three atoms. It shouldn't be complicated, and it, it's not an infrequent molecule, and it's not an unimportant molecule. So, um, also, if, if you could find some catalyst, I showed the, the ammonia example, that was a catalyst. If you found a catalyst that splits water efficiently uh, using sunlight, for instance, um, and cheaply, meaning uh, being made of abundant materials, you, you, you would have solved the energy problem, if you wish. And so just in, in last year, a paper was published proposing this catalyst with iron, which is very cheap, and some simple organic ligand. And, and it's, unfortunately, it's not very efficient, but um, it, it illustrates that uh, we, we, there could be fantastic catalysts out there that, that just do what we need. Um, we just don't know them, right? Because we, we are... Uh, too ignorant. Um, now, why, why do I present this talk on, on a projection? Why don't we have screens all around printed on the walls using um, organic materials that emit light? Why don't we? Right? These are chemical questions. Now, the problem is we suck at, <laughs> at, at controlling this, right? The, the way we, we do chemistry right now is trial and error. We are walking around uh, of course, every now and then, even a, a blind uh, quirrell will find a nut, right? So then you find penicillin and you are happy until all bacteria have become resistant. So what do you do, right? Now, why, why is it so bad? Um, I think there are multiple reasons for this. One of them is, is, is this one, um, that, well, so chemical space is, is really gigantic. This aspirin, it just has 13 atoms. It's, it's really crucial. If, I mean, in my life, I don't know how about your life, but um, <laughs> so I just had this martini lunch, so it's, it's quite important. Anyhow, so if you look at the number of possible molecules you could make as, as a function of size, and so aspirin, if you don't count hydrogens, it has 13 atoms. And, and you see these are organic molecules and this is a very conservative lower bound of what's possible. And aspirin is really a small molecule and yet it's, it's one out of a billion. Right? Um, <clears throat> so it's a, it's a huge space and, and why is this so large? Uh, the, the, it's a convolution of two, um, two components. One is the stoichiometry. If you look at the number of elementary particles that make up chemistry, this is uh, protons or, or electrons, and you look at the possible stoichiometries you could make, these are integer partitions, you see that this number increases exponentially. And so um, you very rapidly have uh, uh, very many possible stoichiometries. Now um, this is protons, any single atom. The zirconium atom has 40 protons. It's roughly half, halfway in your, in your periodic table, right? You, you, you have roughly 100 different elements. So um, you, you should go up to 100 if, if you wanted to cover all the, the entire periodic table. Um, <coughs> so just 10 protons give you the stoichiometries, for instance, of all, all these common small molecules. Um, now, that, that doesn't encode structure yet. It's just composition, right? So you add structure on that, and, and you all know that just take carbon, you can make diamonds, uh, graphite, or charcoal, or nanomaterials. That's, that's the only difference is structure. There's no compositional uh, degree of freedom. It's all carbon. So you combine the two, and, and that's sort of the situation. And, and so there's, there's an estimate, 2004, there was a special issue on nature on chemical space. Uh, the estimate was uh, more than 10 to the 60 uh, possible molecules, which, which you could make, um, and these are just organic molecules, so a very small fraction of the periodic table, right? 
and that's that's a huge number so this is on the order of, of atoms in the universe so so people say you you could not we don't have enough atoms in the universe to make the hard drive to store the list of all the possible uh, molecules not speaking of synthesizing or characterizing them <laughs> now uh, in terms of our understanding of chemistry things are um, like this that these as a function of accuracy in terms of predicting energies which which dictate the the behavior of, of uh, atoms um, you you can only consider a certain amount of atoms a certain scale in terms of number of atoms or sampling them for a certain uh, length of time and so these are the different scales you, you have to consider as you go up to something that that would come close to macroscopic experience so what what you would perceive as a chemical um, as a human um, <coughs> now we are working our methods live on on so given a certain budget CPU budget you can travel up and down on this diagonal and so with with quantum machine learning we would like to to go to very large systems at very high accuracy so move on on this horizontal a different plot um, that illustrates our um, landscape we are, we are navigating on a daily basis um, uh, negotiates cost computational cost uh, versus accuracy of your prediction so these are typical acronyms of, of standard methods like force fields semi-empirical quantum chemistry methods mean field theories Hartree Fock and DFT uh, this perturbation theory uh, here you have quantum Monte Carlo or a couple cluster methods they all approach the exact solution to Schrödinger's equation for any given um, chemical um, so typically with a constant CPU budget you would move on a diagonal um, which goes like this right Ortho orthogonal to that one um, <coughs> now just to give you an idea in terms of, of actual numbers these are ballpark numbers um, you would spend CPU years for something like aspirin to get to 1 kcal per mole accuracy um, which is typically in, in thermochemistry this is the experimental uncertainty and spectroscopy you, you can reach this sort of accuracy so so then you're talking decades now we are trying to to get here with machine learning and we have reasons uh, to believe that this is possible but um, we all we can show is is really just the beginning we I'm not saying we, we did this actually um, uh, for some cases we have strong indications and numer numerical evidence that it's possible um, for that we use the data database we we generated uh, a couple years back uh, we calculated for 134,000 molecules um, DFT numbers so from here so by the way if, if your mean field theory DFT is also mean field theory if it's above this average right it's it's a sweet spot it gives you more than you're supposed to get in terms of accuracy then you get a Nobel Prize um, so uh, we, we have this database and and 134,000 molecules is uh, it sounds like a lot um, it's it's it goes up to nine uh, atoms not counting hydrogens and the most frequent stoichiometry is uh, are these so, these sort of molecules uh, uh, C, seven carbon atoms two oxygens um, and ten hydrogens now if you arrange them in ascending order of the energy it looks like this and you see here in this zoom in we have one kcal per mole accuracy uh, uh, one kcal per mole uh, window so this is the experimental uh, the, the chemical accuracy and within this window you, you see uh, over a hundred molecules and uh, this is zoom in on, on seven of them and you see the structural diversity of, of these molecules right so um, this uh, uh, pushes us to, to I mean this is a statement um, uh, a chemist made that enumeration surpasses the human imagination and I uh, hope that this illustrates that uh, um, this is also the same set of molecules these 6,000 molecules uh, the color corresponds to the energy and these are moments of inertia um, axis here 
So uh, all the 3D molecules are in this corner, the linear ones here and, and the planar ones here. So you see this is how they are distributed. Now there's an interesting thing, you, you see here it's much more sparse and um, there's no reason in terms of energy for, for this region to be sparse. Um, actually, energetically, you should expect much more molecules here. But we do have an inherent human bias as to uh, how we perceive chemistry. Typically, we, we draw these two deep figures. And so when we generate uh, with human-made rules, when we generate molecules, they often um, are, are inherently biased. So that's uh, uh, how this came about. Now, before I show you results here, um, I'd like to point out an interesting thing that um, ordinarily when, when in, in physical chemistry we talk about fitting, this question comes up, uh, how do you avoid the, the overfitting regime and how do you make sure that you're in this optimum of test error versus training error? And um, in fact, what, what we really want is something slightly different. We, we don't actually need this kind of red regression here. Rather, we actually want to go through every data point because every data point is a solution to Schrodinger's equation, which we obtained with a numerical noise many orders of magnitude smaller than the variance of the property we are calculating. So for all intents and purposes, our noise is negligible. And um, so we, we have the problem rather of interpolation than, than real regression. So this has a, a severe effect on how these learning curve look, curves look like. Our training errors are typically um, close, very close to zero. We actually use this to detect uh, uh, bugs in the, in the code as a typical um, test you do. And then your, your test error must come down systematically. This was shown by Vapnik already in the 90s that this has to be the case. And so if, if your test error doesn't come down, I would argue you're not doing machine learning because you stopped to learn, right? Um, and then it's something else. You just have a model. Um, so it was shown by Vapnik and others and, and Müller in the 90s that your error decays inversely with training set size, the prediction error. And what we do in particular is, is to use kernel-rich regression methods. So we estimate a new material, a new material's out-of-sample property, we estimate uh, as a linear combination in, in your training um, where, where you have these kernel functions and the regression coefficients you obtain is a solution to the least square, the regularized least square um, problem, but um, our noise is, is practically zero, so I, I omitted uh, the, the noise term here. Um, so we just invert this training kernel matrix. And if you plot then the, the prediction error as a function of training set size, um, it, it should obey this inverse relationship. And so on a log-log plot, this is a linear one where the, the slope b is the exponent here. And um, so this is something you, you should really uh, find for your model if, if, uh, unless there's, there's some problem. And this is a typical problem that can occur that your machine learning model actually uh, gives you a better error for a small data set, but then it levels off and uh, you, you don't have learning anymore. And, and that's something, um, as quantum chemists, we, we don't like that. So, so we want something that, that continues to converge uh, down to arbitrary accuracy. Um, so this can happen if, for instance, your representation is not unique. I'm showing here two examples. Um, there's a planar, um, geometry, uh, for instance, of ammonia. Uh, imagine the nitrogen in the center. And then you have these interatomic distances, S and L. And if you construct a pyramid where S and L, where S represents the, the edges in the plane and L, the edges of, of the, uh, the nitrogen atom being above or be behind the plane, um, you, you can arrange for geometries where L and S in these two cases uh, are exactly the same. And if then you have a two-body representation which only accounts for, for distances, you, you couldn't distinguish these two geometries. So they really only differ due to many-body effects. And um, you see this, uh, these three curves, they illustrate this. 
If you only have two body, you get for both geometries the dashed. Um, if you add three body terms, this spurious degeneracy gets lifted and you, you get the, the dashed um, uh, solid line here and the solid line. And, and then you can distinguish them. So if, if you used only two body terms in your kernel ridge regression, your learning curve looks like this. Um, another thing you, you'd like to have is, of course, a very a smaller offset. So this is interesting to us, and we investigated what affects the offset. And uh, here's an example of ethanol, and the question how you represent it can really affect how quickly your learning curves change. And there's a paper we recently published with collaborators from Google where we demonstrated that for these organic molecules, you can reach chemical accuracy. Um, and the, the best model here is a kernel rich regression models, model. Um, other colors and symbols correspond to neural networks and other representations. Uh, we did this for many quantum properties. This is just the energy. Um, and the question then is, of course, what, what determines the offset of these various learning curves? Um, <coughs> so, so we did a little exercise where we asked, okay, what kind of functions could we use as a representation in our kernel? And um, we arrived at this, um, a, uh, this yeah, sort of experiment where we said, OK, suppose you have a representation um, where you um, encounter for all interatomic distances with this Coulomb term. So it's nuclear charges of atom i and j um, divided by the distance. But now we, we have this exponent n. And in the Coulomb's law, n equals 1. If you make n equals minus 1, it means that this term grows with the distance of, of the atoms, right? So um, <coughs> that will be unphysical, right? So if, if this interaction grows with the distance. And so if you have one, your learning curve is here. If you become unphysical, you're here. If your interaction grows quadratically, it's even worse. And your learning curve goes up even more. So, so in other words, the, the more physical your representation, the, the lower your learning curves, the more it resembles the energy of, of your target. And so we then decided, okay, let's, let's put a force field as a representation. And we can have force fields that account for atoms, bonds, angles, and torsional degrees of freedom. So th these are two-body, three-body, four-body effects in, in your system. If you provide them in, in the representation, your learning curves come down from black to red and blue. These two are just uh, from the literature. Um, and, and this works for all sorts of properties. Here we have other electronic structure properties which, which are in the data. And you can also see for the outliers that as you go from the dressed atom to the bonding terms to the angle to the torsion, the error on the outlier systematically decreases. So on the left hand, you have nine properties for these isomers, these C7O2 molecules. And here on the right hand side, you now have learning curves for the 134,000 molecules. And we always observe the same trend that as you increase um, the, the degree to which your representation is realistic, um, your learning curve comes down systematically. Now, <coughs> these are the latest results, and you see that uh, for, for something like um, in between 1,000 and 10,000 molecules or so, you reach chemical accuracy for this uh, large uh, QM9 data set. Um, <coughs> so another question is if, if we can affect also the, the slope of these learning curves. The slope has to do with the dimensionality. And, and here's a, a spoiler um, that we succeeded in, in getting to, to do this. Um, uh, and the way we did this was by asking this question. If, if we can look at each atom in a query molecule um, separately, right? And, and we, we, we say, OK, let's, let's look at this atom 
let's just account for its environment, this atom in this molecule, and we can increase this environment systematically by including in the, in the periodic table, we, we extend the periodic table by the environment. So we add neighbors, uh, two neighbors, three neighbors, and so on and so forth. And, and so we can have an extended uh, periodic table of, of, of chemistries, uh, which accounts for, for atoms in, in the molecule. And if you then look at, at the kerner rich regression model, it sums over your training instances. These are your regression weights. And then you have a double summation over atoms and molecules um, for J being in your query and I being in your, in your training instance. Now you can pull the J summation in front of this. And then you, you have these terms for each atom J in your query. So you have a sum over atomic contributions in your query molecule. Furthermore, the, the number of atoms J in your query can be much larger than the number of atoms I in your training molecule. So you can, you can have very small um, molecules to which you compare this atom in its environment, um, independent of all the rest, and you do that for every atom in your query separately. Right? And so, so you can ask this question, okay, suppose this atom here um, is similar to water, then I can grow this and then it's methanol and you see I can add more and more neighbors this is ethanol then I have propanol etc etc and once I'm done with this oxygen I move to the next atom in the query molecule and I repeat and so so then I, I learn the local uh, the local regions independently and and I train on on this training set I train this before I'm doing my query prediction. So, so it's like training on the fly. In comparison to a DFT calculation, which, which takes easily one CPU hour for the entire molecule, training this on the fly is negligible. So how do we know these fragments here? Um, it's a simple procedure we, we have here. It's a flowchart where you go through every atom and you do a sub-graph matching procedure where you identify fragments and for this query molecule these are the fragments you would find as you go to larger and larger fragments and up to seven you have something like 40 different fragments and if you remember before I mentioned uh, 1,000 to 10,000 training instances now we you have 40 right so this is the number of fragments here this is the error on the energy um, you make for predicting this molecule and this is the size of the fragments you, you need. So once you go up to seven, you're, you're here, or, or 40 molecules. And in black, you see the error. And the error comes from above. It crosses zero. It becomes negative, And then it comes up again. As your fragments grow, you, you approach the, the energy of your molecule. It becomes more similar. So, so you come down. You gain by the delocalization of the electrons. But as your fragments become even larger, your, the m query molecule actually contains some strain. It, 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 it's not as relaxed as small fragments. So the fragments will actually be lower in energy than your query. And only once the fragments become large enough again to include the strain you have, for instance, this five membered ring here, you, you come up again from below. So we can understand these kind of error curves. In red, you see a different property than the energy, namely the polarizability. This doesn't only work for the energy, also other properties can, can be modeled this way. Now, this was just one query molecule. We can do this for our data set. So these are average prediction errors made for, um, these, for 11,000 molecules out of the 134,000. And this is how that error comes down and at 10 to the zero, you have chemical accuracy. And this is from, from our paper with the Google collaboration. Um, this is chemical accuracy in, in these units, in electron volt. I'm sorry, this k kappa mole is roughly a factor of 20 in between these two. Um, and you see you hit chemical accuracy at 30,000, right? And here you had something like, um, what is this, 50. So we, we, we can change this slope 
by encoding for, for a different dimensionality uh, in that. And, and so we compared this also to um, taking random fragments. If you take the random fragments rather than selecting them uh, by, the by the graph, the subgraph matching, you get this uh, kind of learning curve which has this, this sort of slope. You can, since these fragments, are, um, they repeat throughout the molecule, but also throughout different query molecules. It's like a dictionary of, of small fragments of chemistry. It's, it's like the DNA of chemistry, right? So it's a very finite um, set of chemistries you actually have to account for. And um, if you compare it to the total size of chemical space, which is 10 to the 60 or so, um, that the number of possible fragments that actually occur is quite small. And so we, we looked at the frequency distribution of, of these fragments, and that's shown here in black. So the smallest fragments are obviously the most frequent ones. And as you have larger and larger fragments, the less frequent they are in, in your um, average query molecule. And if you go up to seven, these are the least frequent um, examples with seven atoms. And you see they are highly um, specific for certain query molecules, for certain chemistries. So um, this is very similar to the frequency, for instance, of words in, in, in sentences, right? So what we have is something like the analog to, to a dictionary. Um, so it's a, it's a dictionary of, of chemistry, if you wish. And then your sentences are, are the query molecules. Um, <coughs> so since, since these uh, fragments are being shared among different uh, query molecules, we can look at overlap. So these are three different query molecules, and they share, uh, here in the overlapping region, they share fragments, and uh, the, the extent of this overlap also tells you how similar these two molecules are, and it also gives you a measure in terms of energy because these energy contributions are always the same um, no matter what's your query compound. Um, now, <coughs> they, let, me, let me correct that. They are, the, the reference values for these um, overlapping molecules are the same, but they enter in the kernel regression different training sets, right? So it's a subset that's, that's identical. But because the, the overall set is not the same, their regression coefficients will actually differ. Now, because it's an atomic summation we have, we can print out atomic energy contributions. And you see those here in numbers next to the atoms. And what you see in brackets, these are numbers that you would obtain from a physics-based force field estimates. And so these, the, the numbers in brackets are numbers which were derived from the physical arguments uh, from humans. And you see ballpark-wise, it's very similar on the scale. So your hydrogens are typically around uh, 50 or 60 or so. Your carbons are 150 or 160. Uh, the oxygen is 90 to 100. Uh, the, the nitrogen is 125 or so. So um, ballpark-wise, the machine discovered um, that these are uh, energies which are physically meaningful. Now, because um, this is fragment-based, it scales. So, so we can make predictions for very large molecules with what we think is chemical accuracy. And if you remember the, 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 the plot where I showed accuracy versus size, um, there's a relationship in, in the traditional and the deductive models we have. But because we have something scalable, we don't suffer from that. So we can predict very large mo molecules, such as LSD here, or um, cholesterol, or Viagra, or, or Taxol, which is an anti-cancer drug. Uh, these are very um, complex uh, molecules. And what you see here is many different machine learning predictions versus reference validation numbers. Um, so these, all these predictions were trained on these small fragments, right? And we are making predictions for large Molecules. So chemically, this is extrapolation, if you wish. But from the machine learning point of view, these chemica chemicals are redundant. So, so <coughs> machine learning-wise, it's an interpolation. Um, what you see in brackets here 
is um, the average error made over all these molecules. So if you just have one atom in your fragment, um, you, you basically don't have bonds, so, so you're really off. Now, if you, if you allow for bonds, your error is, this is the kind of error you would make if, if you were just counting the bonds. Uh, so no, only two body interactions. If you allow for three body, you, you get this down, and this is a typical force field sort of accuracy. Um, with DFT, you, you would get this kind of error, and this is the experimental uncertainty. Um, so this chemical accuracy reach, on average, uh, with fragments up to seven atoms. Now this also works for polymers. Here you see very large uh, polymers, um, uh, and here you see the number of monomers we tested, and you see systematic improvement. Uh, the prediction error decays systematically with system size at 100 uh, fragments or so you typically reach chemical accuracy. So this, this sort of problem um, we, we can definitely solve. Um, <coughs> these are water clusters. This is what you have to get right, for instance, to get the phase diagram for water right. Uh, also here you see systematic improvement down to chemical accuracy um, for predicting these water clusters. This also works in periodic boundary conditions. These are 2D sheets of, of uh, materials doped with carbon or, or gold. Um, and also here you see systematic improvement, uh, so reducing um, prediction errors with training set size. And um, here is a bulk example. This is silicon. You see the error on predicting the energy of silicon decaying and the fragments we use here are these silanes which are uh, saturated with hydrogens. Um, it's sort of the DNA of chemistry, so of course we wanted to look if we can use that to make predictions on DNA. And that's what you see here, the Watson-Crick base pair of guanine and cytosine. This is its energy. And these are the fragments you need for guanine. These are the fragments you need for cytosine. And these fragments the two share. And these down here are all the fragments you need to cover the hydrogen bonding in, in this DNA base pair. Um, so with this, I, I come to my concluding remarks. There's one um, analogy to, to quantum mechanics. If, if you solved by variational principle or, or with quantum Monte Carlo, you solved um, the Schrodinger equation, you get the expectation value, say, of your energy. Um, you have the, the wave function, and then you can use that wave function to calculate expectation values for any other operator, to get any other observable, right? So the wave function doesn't really depend on your property. Now, there's some analogy to, to the Kernel-Rich regression, because here when you train, your kernel, the kernel inversion, doesn't depend on your property. You can multiply in any reference vector to get the corresponding regression coefficient. So in some sense, the regression coefficients correspond to your property, the kernel to your wave function. We showed this for molecules. These are very different properties of many molecules, and this uh, really works. Um, when traditionally we, we map composition and coordinates to energy with, by solving the wave function problem, as described by my previous speaker, the machine learning really um, allows us to to infer that solution um, given sufficient training set sizes. So in some sense, the traditional um, relationship between experiment and quantum mechanics informing the human is augmented by a third component here where we also use machine learning um, to accelerate um, the, the, our understanding of uh, chemical problems. <coughs> this is an outlook. Um, we used um, our model to predict forces now. And um, these are forces on a molecule which was not part of training, again, using this fragment approach. And before, um, you see the deviation in geometry, and you can relax the geometry, and you, you obtain very good agreement. This also works for, for non-covalent bonding. Finally, I leave this in, in case you're looking for a PhD in chemistry or, or postdoc position. Uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you for your attention.